So, I've got $1,000 to spend on a lens. Should it be a $1,000 photo lens or a $1,000 cine lens? And which one's gonna look more cinematic? In this episode of Film Science, we put six lenses to the test from $300 to $15,000 to see what looks the best for its price and what really makes a lens city. All right, so we have six photo and cine lenses we're putting to the test. First up at $379, we have the classic Canon 50mm EF f1.4. At $949, we have the Sigma Art, and at a little more than double, we have the $2,099 Canon RF f1.2. On the cine side, we have the Mica T2.2 50mm. And at $649, it seems to be wildly affordable. Stepping up to $3,950, we have the Canon EF T1.3 Cine Prime. And at an eye-watering $15,400, we have the Ari Ultra Prime T1.9 lens. We took all of these out to the court at sunrise for a bit of a real world test on the Komodo. While it's not a scientific or pixel peeping test, we can get a good feel for each of the lenses. So, we're back in the studio and it's time to take a look at the shots. But first we need to talk about what makes a shot look good or cinematic. Because each of these lenses is still made out of pretty much the same parts. And yes, this lens was already broken before I started. All of these pieces, your elements, their coating, the housing and the aperture, they're all working together to project an image circle onto our sensor. And the configuration and quality of these pieces is going to impact the image in six ways. Sharpness, focus, distortion, color and contrast, bokeh, and flares. So number one is the sharpness of a lens, which is how crisp and clear the details of an image are when they're in focus. Your lens elements are moving back and forth to focus a subject, but from lens to lens, it will differ how sharp they actually get. In a way, different lenses have different levels of resolution that they can support. We don't want an overly soft lens, but depending on the project, we might not want an overly sharp lens too. It can start to feel a little bit clinical. A piece of vintage glass that is a little bit soft might give us a really nice organic or analog feeling shot. All of the lenses we tested were nice and sharp, except for the EF50, but that might be because it's a cheap lens I've had for eight years. While the Sigma had a clinical crispness to it, the Cine lenses, especially the Canon Cine and the Ari, had a bit of a soft glow without removing details. Number two is our depth of field. If you've made it this far, you know that aperture impacts your depth of field, but this gets a little tricky to compare between photo and cine lenses because f-stops aren't the same as t-stops. While f-stop measures the size of the aperture, t-stop takes into account the actual transmission of light through the lens. This of course will be impacted by the number of elements in a lens and also in the coatings. So we just need to keep in mind when we're talking about depth of field and aperture, we can't directly compare lenses measured in f-stops to lenses measured in t-stops. Stops. We were able to shoot really open with all of our lenses, except for the Mica that only went down to T2.2. Realistically, this was open enough for the majority of our shots. But we can't move on without talking about focus breathing. When you refocus a photo lens, most of the time there'll be the appearance of some zoom, because the lens is moving internal elements to refocus. And this isn't a big problem for photo lenses, because you're using them to take a single frame. When it comes to video or film, however, this can be kind of distracting, so a lot of cine lenses have an additional element that corrects for this. I'm sure you've seen demos of this a million times, but let's do another one. The Canon RF had the most obvious focus breathing, and there was also a bit when we tested the Ari and the Canon EF2. But the surprise here was the Mica, which was really minimal. Next up is the distortion of a lens. When you have straight lines, do they bend across the frame or towards the edges? In general, lenses will have either barrel distortion, pincushion distortion, which is the inverse, or a wavy mix of both. And again, the presence or lack of distortion isn't necessarily a bad or good thing. A complete lack of distortion can look quite clinical, and we can use distortion to create an emotional response or a vibe. Skate videos are iconic for their use of fisheye, even to this day, and really it just comes down to what you like the look of and what vibe you're trying to portray. This is kind of hard to talk about in our test, because on the 50s, the distortion is pretty minimal, and I only really noticed it on the mica. This would definitely be more of a consideration if we were to redo this test on some wider primes or some zoom lenses. Which brings us to one you don't often think of in terms of lenses, which is color and contrast. Okay, quick editor's note. We messed up the footage a bit later in the day. This is an ND filter, which blocks some light making our footage darker, but not all ND filters block infrared light, meaning you can get a whole lot of IR pollution in the black parts of your image. While we can still look at the footage critically, this is why some of it later in the day has a red tint. Oops. 
Each of the lens elements has chemical coatings to manage reflections and improve its optical qualities. And in doing so, they're also going to impact the color and contrast of the resulting image. But the question is, does that really matter when we're going to correct and grade our footage anyway? Well, yes and no. It's nice to have a better image to work with when you're starting your process. One of the big advantages of a nice set of cine primes is that from lens to lens, they will match color-wise, and that's not necessarily the case with photo primes. But something else to think about is the contrast and micro contrast contrast, or localized contrast. Some lenses just show details better, and when combined with the crispness of a lens, can make an image either feel flat or pop and have some three-dimensionality. In terms of contrast, the photo lenses appear to have more global contrast than the cine primes, with the RE being the least contrasty. This didn't mean the RE was flat at all though, because the details were still clear and our subject popped, but the much bigger note was color. The Canon lenses, across the board, were much cooler than the others, which appeared more warm and green. You've also got to think about the aberration of the lens, because the colour differs from lens to lens, and as we noticed in this test, from brand to brand. The Canons had some pretty pronounced green and pink aberration, while the Sigma and Mica were more yellow and green. The RE definitely had the nicest aberration though, which was more subtle and seemed to blend into the image. Okay, back to the court for the next one, the bokeh. We use bokeh to talk about the out of focus area in an image and how it looks. Bright lights can become distinct circles or a bit more blurred, like this. Wow, bokeh. But the nature of this is gonna depend on a few elements in the lens. The aperture's shape and number of blades will determine the shape of the bokeh, and the spherical aberration correction will determine how clean or textured that bokeh is. You don't really need to understand how any of this works, only that each lens will have different bokeh as a result. On modern lenses, engineers are going for the cleanest bokeh possible, but on some lenses, you'll get some hard edges or texture. The Canon RF had clean, even bokeh that was pretty pleasant and similar to the Ari, which did have some subtle texture. The Canon EF and the Sigma, though, both had quite uneven bokeh, with the Sigma having a noticeable donut look. And finally, the last thing for us to consider is flares. Flares are somewhat inevitable and caused by light bouncing off the internal elements of a lens. In general, the inside of the housing will be matte black in order to avoid excessive flares, but the nature and color of the ones that do make it through are going to be impacted by, again, the coatings on the glass. And these differ from manufacturer to manufacturer and lens to lens. Because of the weather on this shoot, we didn't capture any natural flares, but from a quick test in our studio, the Mica had a stronger rainbow flare, whereas the Canons were more of a green flare. But there's actually a really important factor we haven't talked about yet, and it's why, irrespective of price, a cine lens might be right or not right for you. And that's UX considerations. Cine lenses remove a lot of the smart assists that a photo lens would give you. No autofocus means you might need an AC, and no image stabilization may mean you need more support gear. There are all considerations you need to make, because cine lenses aren't designed so much for solo operators as they are for finer control over each element. On the flip side, a continuous aperture lets you ramp during a shot without jumps or steps, and a rigid connection to the focus with built-in gears makes it better for a follow focus system should you choose to use one. So, what's the pick? For me, I really liked the Canon RF 50mm, and I'd probably pick it for anything that's going on YouTube or that we're shooting on a mirrorless body. I think it looks really great, and I liked the UX features like the aperture ring, but if you are on more of a budget, something like the Sigma looked great too. But for shooting launch campaigns where the budget's a bit higher, I'd opt for renting a set of solid cine primes, like the Canons. The quality difference is a little bit more subtle, and I don't think we could quite justify the cost increase of the Aries at the budget level we work at. But a lot of it will come down to what you like the look of and what works well for what you shoot. I didn't really hate any of the lenses we tested, and for their price, the cheaper lenses like the Micas were actually really impressive. If you want to watch all of our test footage, there's a link to the Syrup Lab blog in the description below. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you later.